Here's our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Inside. I'm Tian Wei in Beijing. Let's begin our show in the Middle East. The tensions between Iran and the U.S. took a dramatic spike after Soleimani's death. Iran has promised to strike back against the United States, but U.S. President Donald Trump has threatened Tehran with major retaliation if it attacks. Trump also threatened Iraq with severe sanctions if it forces out American troops. Soleimani's death, it is a big issue, certainly in the region. Let's take a look at the latest. Huge crowds gather in Iran, paying their respects to General Qasim Soleimani. Across Iran, millions more are expected to take part in events to honor the country's top military leader ahead of his burial on Tuesday. Iran's parliament on Tuesday announced U.S. Department of Defense, the Pentagon, as terrorist organizations. The emergency motion was also unanimously passed during an open session of the parliament. Tehran announced it had abandoned the remaining limits of its nuclear deal with world powers in response to the slaying of Soleimani while in Iraq. China's foreign ministry has called on the U.S. not to overuse its force, saying all sides should return to dialogue as soon as possible. The sovereignty, independence and territorial integrity of all parties should be respected, and peace and stability in the Middle East Gulf region should be maintained. We call on the U.S. not to overuse its force. Also, we urge all related parties to remain calm and exercise restraint to avoid further escalating tensions. On Friday, Soleimani was killed in a U.S. airstrike at Baghdad airport. Tensions between the two sides have surged since. Lawmakers in Iraq have voted to kick foreign troops out of the country, but the United States has no plans to pull its troops out of Iraq. Meanwhile, European leaders have urged de-escalation between the U.S. and Iran. While over in Brussels, NATO held its own urgent meeting to weigh up a response. But this is a crisis that's brought sharp divisions into clear focus. European powers are caught between supporting a key ally in the U.S. while looking to prevent further bloodshed in the Middle East. For the latest on U.S. and Iran relations at this critical moment, we are joined in Tehran by Mohammed Marandi, a professor at Tehran University. Meanwhile, we are also joined in the U.S. in Boston, Jim Walsh, senior research associate at MIT's security studies program. I want to welcome both of you. And gentlemen, we need to be brief in our answers, but may I ask you both a question first. First of all, we've seen actions and reactions from both sides. Reports suggest the U.S. even would deny the visa of the foreign minister of Iran going to the U.N. conference later this week. Well, Iran right now has already identified the Defense Department of the United States as the terrorist groups. With all of these rhetorics going on, what do you think will be the degree of further escalation? Let me go to you first, uh, Professor Morandi in Iran. Let's be brief on both sides, please. Go ahead, sir. I think there's no doubt that the Iranians will retaliate and there will be a military response and the Iranians will carry out uh, an attack uh, on the United States uh, military to send a message to the Americans that they can no longer uh, kill and murder people and Iranians and Iranian leaders with impunity. And uh, if the United States chooses to strike Iran after that, then to be very blunt, all those countries that have American bases hosted in their territory in the Persian Gulf region, they will be seen as hostile entities and I think that uh, they will uh, be uh, attacked as well. And I okay. think that regimes like the United Arab Emirates will cease to exist very swiftly, very quickly. Mr. Walsh, from the U.S. perspective, to what degree the escalation of tension will go from here to what nature? Well, I do think uh, Iran will respond. And then the question will be, will the U.S. react to that? The president has made all sorts of wild threats in the last several days. I think in some ways those threats 
make an Iranian response, response more likely. You know, I mean, if you get up and make a bunch of threats, you've really backed Iran in a corner. So I think Iran is responding. I will say they seem to be signaling that they're trying to respond proportionately. That is to say, their response, the hit was a military hit. They're going to respond with a military target, not a civilian target, which may have happened in the past. So I think there's a sense that the Iranians are trying to keep it proportionate and same for same. If that's the case, maybe we can escape another cycle of violence. But if you take the president at his word, which you do at some risk, okay. I think, uh, then if Iran responds, uh, the U.S. will take another action, unfortunately. Now, what the Iranians are doing now is about the nuclear deal. What the U.S should be struggling with, it seems, is whether troops or not in Iraq, and also what's going to happen to American citizens as well as troops in the Middle East. On those two points, I want to go to both of you once again. Also, to what degree will things change, uh, Mr. Morandi, measured or not? I think that since uh, Trump also carried out a, an act of war in Iraq against Iraqis by murdering a senior Iraqi commander and also killing Iraqi soldiers, and after the vote in parliament, we will see uh, less tolerance towards America's, Amer the United States military in Iraq, and that will probably lead to violence if the United States does not withdraw. With regards to American citizens, I agree uh, with your good guests in the United States. Uh, the Iranians will not target uh, citizens, but those countries that aid the United States uh, in this war, they will be targeted. Their mm. infrastructure will be targeted, and uh, they are small and vulnerable. Uh, the Emirates and other countries okay. that, that I don't really think I need to name, uh, they, will, they will cease to exist, and therefore I think at this stage the best thing is for all foreigners and whoever can leave the Persian Gulf region, they should leave now. It seems that Professor Hopefully Morandi will happen, but did not mention much the about the nuclear deal, but I guess uh, we can also discuss that a bit later in our program. Go to you also, Mr. Walsh, just to be fair, about troops withdrawal or not. There's so <laughs> much confusion going on in Washington, even within the military commanders themselves. Yeah, yesterday we had the Defense Department announcing it was leaving Iraq only within the hour to announce, no, that was a mistaken announcement, so there is confusion. Now listen, I think we need, uh, we're obviously in a bad place, we're headed down a bad road, but there is some reason to hope, hope, that it doesn't go as badly as it could. Why do I say that? I don't think the Iran wants to fight a full-blown war in the Middle East against Saudi Arabia and UAE and the U.S. It doesn't want to, it wants to defend its honor and its sovereignty, but I don't think it wants to fight a big war because that would be very harmful to Iran. The U.S., for its part, you know, talks all the time but doesn't act like it wants a war. Remember, it rescinded missile strikes during the summer. But then, you know, sort of out of the blue, Trump massively escalates. Does he want a big war in the Middle East? I'm guessing not. So hopefully that basic preference will act as a guardrail and prevent both sides from careening into something terrible. But once starts, you know, once you start shooting, and that's what right. we've done, the U.S. has fired the first shot here, uh, then, you know, who knows what's going to happen. So I'm hoping cooler heads will prevail. Uh, I don't think ev anyone really wants a war. I do think the okay. Saudis and the UAE and the Emirates are all paying attention here. They see themselves as vulnerable, will be voices for restraint. But at the end of the day, it depends on President Trump. And I cannot predict what he's going to do. It seems that many of the U.S. allies are trying to distance itself from the U.S. in terms of the decision of uh, assassinating uh, the Iranian military official, even including Israel. Having said that, though, thank you very much for both of you. Stay with us. We're going to have more con continuation of this discussion later. But for now, let me also introduce from the European side, we have uh, Joseph Yenin, who is uh, a 
senior policy fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations, and also in our Beijing studio from Chinese side, Li Guofu, director of the Center for Middle East Studies at the China Institute of International Studies. Welcome to both of you. Mr. Yanning, I want to go to you first about some of the latest development. Very tricky for the Europeans, I guess, at this moment. Wants to distance itself from the decision to assassinate a Iranian military official, but at the same time do not want the Iranians to walk away from the Iranian nuclear deal too much and still want some space in between. Are the Europeans able to do that? Well, that's right, Tian Tian Wei. Uh, the situation from a European perspective has become far more difficult. Uh, because uh, um, the, the incentives that Europeans can offer uh, to Iran to stay within the boundaries of the deal of the JCPOA uh, are rather limited. Uh, they mostly can appeal to the goodwill of Iran. At this point, this goodwill uh, is not there. Iran has announced to move further away uh, from the obligations of the treaty, which will create even more problems for the Europeans. But on the other hand, Mr. Yanning, just to be fair, aren't the Europeans uh, having also the obligation to criticize your ally? After all, the U.S. took that action without noticing or giving note to any of its allies about this action and took everybody by surprise. And I'm afraid it's a not good surprise, but rather a very bad surprise, Mr. Yanning. Yes, that's true. That's true. But they, they have realized, they have understood by now that with this administration, uh, their feelings, their frustrations, and their interests uh, play a rather limited role. Uh, so Europeans uh, not only uh, do not think that targeted killing is an appropriate instrument, uh, they can think of only very few cases where it might be legitimate, but also they believe that the U.S. administration does not really have a strategy. Uh, but its actions are erratic, uh, are contradictory, uh, and are not thought through. But so it is not so much the question whether uh, they have been consulted before or not, but it's the question whether there is a sound and reliable U.S. partner uh, that they could work with. Isn't that the question, Mr. Yanning? I mean, one could not use the excuse of not having a good strategy for all the wrong actions taken so far because it's going to have a consequences for everyone. And if those are using that as an excuse or that is exactly the reality, what are the Europeans going to do? That's the question, isn't it, Mr. Yenin? That's right. That, that is the question. Uh, and that's where uh, Europe's uh, power is, is very limited. Um, the Europeans uh, are uh, very good when it comes to rewarding actors, when it comes to shaping positive environments. But when uh, uh, they are faced with an escalation of negative uh, uh, actions, uh, their own assets are rather um, limited. I see. And uh, they, of course they disapprove uh, with the way that the United States acts in the region. Uh, but they have uh, no means to actually affect U.S. decision-making at this point. All right. That is, of course, the European perspective. Very realistic, I guess, uh, at this moment. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Yen. You stay with us as well. Let's talk about the Iranian nuclear deal because that is the most important thing for now uh, when we think about the regional and the world peace. Um, so go to you, Professor Morandi, about that first. What exactly does that mean? The very measured language put forward by the Iranians in the latest statement. Well, well the Iranians will continue to decrease, decrease their commitments uh, within the framework of the nuclear deal because the Europeans have done nothing positive. Uh, contrary to what your good guess said about the Europeans, the Europeans have done nothing constructive. They've basically obeyed Trump, they've grumbled, but they've done exactly as he said. So by appeasing Trump, Europe has made Trump more aggressive. So Trump's attack and his active war against Iran and his active war against Iraq, in my opinion, are partially a result of European policy. And therefore, 
the, the subsequent, and the Europeans didn't even condemn the murder of high-ranking military yeah. officials in Iran. But, but in if Iraq I could, the uh, Professor States. Morandi, the if Europeans if didn't even condemn Trump's threats could, to attack cultural heritage sites. If I could, uh, Professor Morandi, uh, that is my question is more regarding the Iranian nuclear deal. So I noticed the language from the Iranian side very measured about the enrichment capacity, about the extent of the enrichment, about the nuclear research and also developments. According to the latest statement, it will continue. So what exactly does that mean? Does it give more maneuvering space for the Iranians, uh, Professor Morandi? Yes, what the Iranians are trying to do is by gradually decreasing their commitments, and we have to keep in mind that the monitoring of the International Atomic Energy Agency, their oversight over the nuclear program in Iran, continues within the framework of the nuclear agreement. So Iran hasn't uh, discontinued all its commitments, and what the Iranians want to do is to pressure the Europeans by this gradual decrease of commitments to start abiding by their commitments. And the Iranians have said that if the Europeans begin to act positively, then the Iranians will reverse these uh, measures that they've taken. And if the Europeans abide by their commitments in full, the Iranians will abide by the nuclear deal in full. In okay. full. So it's really up to the Europeans. If uh, the Europeans stand up to the United States, we can move, move forward. If they don't, then we are moving towards greater tension in the region. Uh, I didn't realize that eventually the discussion has become Iranians and the Europeans. Is it fair, Mr. Jianin? What should the Europeans do? Can the Europeans do anything? You just said it's incapable of doing anything so far. But what about the Iranian nuclear deal? Well, you know, I think that that is wrong-footed. You know, if you if you want uh, to uh, uh, win something in this conflict by driving a wedge between the Europeans and the Americans, I don't think that you will get very far. Uh, if I read the latest statements from Tehran uh, correctly, uh, the focus is not so much on Europe. Yes, it is also on Europe, but the principal focus is on the United States. Uh, the Iranian uh, government has emphasized that uh, in order for it to return to its obligations, uh, all sides to the agreement uh, have to do their share, and that includes the United States. And I believe that at this point, uh, the focus is primarily uh, on Washington. I believe that the Iranians have more or less given up no. on the Europeans because they have seen that actually uh, their means are limited, and uh, European business is not controlled by the state. So European companies uh, are, are so heavily invested mm. uh, in the U.S. market that no instex and no other instruments that European governments uh, can provide will uh, turn them around to doing business with Iran instead okay. of doing business with the United States. Uh, Mr. Walsh from the U.S., you keep on nodding your head, but that does not give you any excuse not to answer my next question either. Let me give you uh, this question. That is. The fact that the U.S. withdrew from the JCPOA, Iranian nuclear deal, does not really provide the U.S. not to do anything in order to save the situation. Now you have the U.S. taking one further step, assassinating a military official coming from Iran, making all the things ever more complicated. But the U.S. still has the responsibility to make sure the denuclearization on this issue or isn't it, Mr. Walsh? What's going to be the U.S. role in this regard? Any respect, do you think, from the rest of the world as a result? I don't see the U.S. rejoining the Iran nuclear agreement. I just don't see that. If anything, uh, the arrow is pointed in the other direction. Now, we recently had uh, the announcement. Uh, Iran has been making announcements every 60 days about stepping back from the agreement. And you asked about where we're at and where this is going. It seems to me that the, the Iranian announcement, in the American media, when I was on TV all day yesterday, they misinterpreted the Iranian announcement. They thought this announcement was somehow part of the reaction to the uh, killing of Soleimani. It was not. If anything, the announcement yesterday was rather modest, another half step away, saying, in principle, the Iranians are not obliged by the agreement, but not actually announcing any behavior, any All actions right. 
like 20 percent enrichment that would have caught people's attention. So far, what we've had is two parallel tracks. There's the nuclear track and the U.S.-Iranian bilateral track. And the nuclear track is sort of chugged away, getting a little bit worse, a little bit worse every day. Now we have an explosive development in the U.S. bilateral agreement. They have still mostly been separate tracks, but as we go forward, okay. if the U.S.-Iranian relationship continues to decline and there's an exchange of, you know, an attack and then a response and an attack, then at some point those nuclear facilities may be targeted. And if that's the case, that's the point at which the two tracks cross, if the U.S. were to take military action against Iranian nuclear facilities, that would represent a new unprecedented level of threat. I think my own personal opinion is that it would result in Iran deciding okay. to acquire nuclear weapons. So that's the real danger is that at some point this terrible relationship we have with Iran is going to spill over into violence with regard to the nuclear do program. Do agree? And then we're going to be in a way worse do, do place. Do you agree, Professor well, Morandi? Let me give you today. also some airtime for our Iranian guests, please. Uh, uh, Professor Morandi, do you agree with that? The so-called two tracks as illustrated by Mr. Walsh. But uh, does the, do the Iranian think about it in a different logic? I think that uh, the the path to violence is quite correct. I don't believe that Iran will be pursuing a nuclear weapon at any point, but I do believe that, uh, contrary to what your European guest says, the Europeans have done absolutely nothing. The letter that Iran sent was not directed to the United States because it's not a part of the agreement. It was directed toward to the Europeans. The Europeans have been in complete violation of the deal. And if the Europeans do not rein in Trump, if the issue is not driving a wedge, if they do not rein in Trump, and if internal factors in the United States do not rein in Trump, since he is so unpredictable, he could lead the whole region to war. And then your European guests should be waiting for many millions of people moving towards Europe. All right. I'll have uh, Mr. Yanning to very briefly react to this and before I go to Mr. Li, also in China. Uh, Mr. Yanning first. Well, you know, one point I agree with, uh, that is indeed, if the region further destabilizes, uh, the externalities, the negative externalities will be felt uh, more in Europe uh, than in the United States. Uh, and if uh, uh, Iraq uh, goes down the drain, and if the situation escalates in northern Syria, we could easily have another major wave uh, of migrants. I think that's, that's the risk, that's the threat that uh, hangs over the heads of the Europeans. And that's what they will be trying to uh, avoid, but within the rather limited means that they have. Mm. Mr. Li, you've been sitting here in Beijing listening to your colleagues coming from the Chinese Foreign Ministry. Repeatedly, it's about ultimate restraint on all sides, not to escalate the current situation already existing. So, Mr. Li, uh, important part of the UN Security Council China is, and also certainly have been interacting with Iran, meanwhile having some interesting situations with the United States right now. Uh, so where is China in terms of the Iranian nuclear deal? How much persuasive power do you think Beijing has toward Tehran and even toward putting a word to Washington as complicated as Washington is today? I think that China, from the very beginning, were well, very active in the negotiations and push all sides uh, to make that deal. Uh, I think you know this is a very uh, positive uh, role has been recognized by all the parties. Since the U.S. withdrew from uh, the GCPOA, we also you know together with other remaining parties uh, and uh, try you know to preserve the nuclear deal. One of the part of China's do is, you know, to keep our commitments, our responsibilities mm -hmm. of the deal. For example, you know, uh, we keep in trading, especially buying oil from the Iran. This is a part of what has been agreed within the principle of the nuclear deal. I see. And at this very critical moment, you know, we first we urged all sides, you know, try our best efforts to preserve the deal because this deal is so important for you know the world peace especially in the region. I see. Mr. Li, on the other hand we see 
China, Iran, and also Russia not long ago have joined military exercise. That has been so much in the media. So uh, to what extent, how should we understand that earlier piece of the news before, of course, uh, the big news happened about the assassination of the Iranian uh, military official by the United States. But how should we understand China's role on a bigger context, Mr. Li? I think first, you know, China uh, uh, Navy has uh, joined exercise with the regional countries, not only with uh, Iran, but also with uh, the other GCC countries. Uh, the second very important fact, you know, the Middle East is becoming more important for China. And China wanted to guarantee what China interests has been preserved or guaranteed in the region. Mm. Now, before we go, I want to have every one of you one sentence, if we can, if we can have the four guests with us right now. What do you think will be the next step and the key issues in your mind? Let's go to Mr. Walsh first from the U.S. Uh, this is as dangerous a time as it's been in more than a decade. I expect Iran to respond. And then the question will be, what will be the nature of Mr. Trump's reaction? Depending on that reaction, things could okay. stabilize or go very, very poorly very quickly. Professor Morandi from Tehran. I agree with Jim. I think that it depends on Trump. Iran will respond. And then we have to wait and see what Trump does. If Trump engages in military conflict, then I think really now's the time for people to leave the Persian Gulf region. Mr. Yanin, from the European side, of course, you are based in Boston. Well, I believe that next to. Yes. Uh, I believe uh, that, that uh, next to uh, an, a, an Iranian response, the uh, most immediate uh, effect will be uh, that the Western presence in Iraq uh, will uh, enter a period of deep crisis and may come to an end rather quickly. Uh, and that will not be good. That will uh, not be positive for the uh, development in the region, including uh, Syria as well. Mm. Finally, Mr. Lee, final word. Uh, I think, you know, and uh, any, you know, the efforts uh, to de-escalating the tensions to prevent the, the further war in the region serve all the peoples or countries' interests in the region. I see. Li Guofu, Joseph Yanin, Jim Walsh, Mohammed Morandi. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us from different parts of the world and helping us to understand all the latest. Really appreciate it. Thank you.